Thank you. Uh, as you can see, I had braced myself for a long introduction uh, because it's a very, very Indian thing to do. Uh, to say, Hamare aaj ke mehman kisi taaruf ke mahataz nahi hai. And then go on to do precisely that for 15 minutes or so. <laughs> so I had actually prepared myself for a 10 minute long uh, Wikipedia entry to be read out. <laughs> but I'm very, very grateful that I was spared that. <laughs> uh, very happy to be here. Uh, in many ways, uh, you could say today is just the wrong day for me to be here and to speak uh, on the topic that I'm speaking. I don't know how many of you keep in touch with your uh, social media when you are sitting in a class or pretending to listen to a lecture, uh, but if you do, you would know what I'm talking about. Uh, with so much of muck flinging around, uh, if there was one day in the last one year that you should not be talking about the idea of ARP, uh, today happens to be that day. And here I am uh, speaking exactly about that. And for that very reason, allow me to say, today is actually the day we should be talking about the idea of ARP. Because there is a difference between the idea of something and its actual manifestation. And the way history moves is precisely by approximation of reality to ideals that it sets for itself. We set a certain ideal for ourselves and then we try hard, we very often fail. But, that's, but that idea or that ideal continues to be our guiding star which takes us forward. So I wish to convince you today that there is something called an idea of ARP which is not restricted to an organization called Aam Admi Party, which is not restricted to any individual or a set of individuals, which is not restricted to any event or any specific manifestation. I wish to convince you that there is a deeper yearning in our country, perhaps even beyond our country, that this phenomena called Aam Admi Party happens to symbolize. I have no hesitation in admitting right in the beginning that the phenomena called Aam Admi Party is an imperfect realization. It's an experiment in making to achieve something that has come up in this phase of history, not just in our country, but in many other parts of the world. And it is that idea that I want to draw your attention to, that I wish to talk about. But before I say what that idea is, let me quickly say what it is not. When we say, talk about alternative politics, we do not mean alternatives to politics. This is how it was misunderstood. When Anna movement started, you had protests in India Gate, in uh, Ramlila Maidan, and there was this syndrome of I hate politics. These, all these netas are chor. All these people are, you know, whatever, they need to be, uh, we need to get rid of them. So there was that syndrome of hating politics, which is what got confused initially with this movement. The moment we became a party, of course, most of those colleagues left us. But there was a very strong streak of I hate politics. I wish to say right in the beginning that hating politics is hating democracy. Because while politics pervades all over the world, you don't need to be a democracy in order to have politics. Dictatorships have politics all the time. But democracy cannot survive without politics. The very lifeblood of democracy is politics. 
Therefore, when we say democracy is lovely, but I hate politics, there's something deeply hypocritical about it. Because democracy simply cannot survive without politics. So when we say I hate politics, I want a situation where there's no politics, where we pick up things and say, oh my God, there's politics in cricket. Oh my God, there's politics in farmers movement. Oh, there's this lovely discussion about land acquisitions, but there's politics in it. I just want you to hold your horses and give it a thought. Do we want a country, do we want to live in a democracy where most important questions of our time are not discussed in politics? Just come to think of it. The current debate on land acquisitions bill. Suppose there was no politics around it. Suppose no political party was in the competitive business of scoring points over each other. Would we at all have any hope of justice for farmers of this country? Just give it a thought. Just think of 10 questions which are not politicized in this country and 10 questions which are politicized in this country. Women's security, so far, till about a one year ago or so, has not been a political question in this country. And that's why women's security happens to be such a low priority for everyone in this country. The moment it becomes politicized, it begins to be addressed. I'm not saying the problem gets solved. But when something gets politicized, it's actually lovely news. It's actually very good news. Because it gets put on the national radar. It gets, put, it, it gets placed on a radar of national sensibilities, which is what we need. So in fact, I do believe that more and more issues ought to be politicized. Education ought to be politicized. Health. Unfortunately, health is not a political question in our country. Health ought to be politicized. The day health becomes a political question, you would begin to wonder why India spends only 1.3% of its GDP on health. And why is it that China spends three times more than that? You know, lots and lots of questions will begin to be asked the moment health becomes a political question. Anyway, all that is aside, I just wanted to say alternative politics does not mean alternatives to politics. Because alternatives to politics are alternatives to democracy. That's dangerous. That's deadly. Beware. Alternative politics is also not political alternatives. What do I mean by political alternatives? Political alternatives are established alternatives to established politics. You get rid of Samajwadi Party and you have the lovely BSP waiting for you. You get, a, get rid of BSP, maybe it's the turn for the BJP. There is a certain oscillation that takes place within the given political establishment of the country. So that oscillation within the establishment is not what I'm talking about. That's not what alternative politics is. That's political alternatives. Which is to say, there is, they all operate within the same spectrum of very limited policy options. They all operate within the very limited space of organizational templates. Faces change, acronyms change, policies do not change, and the fundamental ways of doing politics do not change. So that's political alternatives. I'm not into political alternatives. The idea of ARP is not about political alternatives. The idea of ARP is about alternative politics. It represents something much deeper in our country, deeper yearning for alternative politics, something which has been there for quite some time, which has been articulated in different ways. It is not something which began with Anna movement. It is something which has been in the country for at least two to three, three decades, I would say, but which for various reasons happened to come to fruition only recently. What is that idea? <clears throat> Underlying that idea is an attempt to balance two things. One, political viability. So there's a political side to it and there is an ethical side to it. When I say alternative politics, there is alternative, 
which is the ethical thrust, and there is politics, which is the viability thrust. For quite some time in our country, these two things have pulled in opposite direction. Those who wanted to do alternatives, those who wanted to do ethical politics, had no way of being viable. They were not workable. Everyone said, yeah, if you are, you are so good, you know, as they used to tell me when I was contesting parliamentary election from Gurugao, you know, they would come to me and say, you're too good to be in politics. You know, that's the ultimate compliment in some ways, but it's also an ultimate indictment of politics. You're, you're too good, too good to be in politics. So what in a sense we are saying is ethics and viability cannot go together. You know, so there is the ethical side of it, which is a search for ways of doing politics, which, you know, a politics which is driven by ethical impulse, which is driven by driven by larger goals, which is not merely business as usual. And on the other hand, there is the political impulse, namely viability, winnability, ability to be there. And what makes ARP to be such a, diff what makes ARP to be a phenomena worth discussing, we don't discuss every party, there are parties which have done very well, uh, probably not as well as Aam Aadmi Party did in the Delhi election, that was something of a phenomena, but the phenomena was being discussed even before we got 67 seats. But what makes Aam Aadmi Party into a phenomena is not the fact that it has one election in one state. So many parties have, they win, they go, all kinds of things happen. What makes it a phenomena is its ability to bring together these two seemingly impossible impulses. Alternative and politics, viability and ethical imperative. That is what makes it alternative politics. What does Aam Aadmi Party do? You know, in which ways is it alternative politics? I want to talk about it in two broad, under two broad rubrics of what does the idea of ARP represent? What does this alternative politics represent? One under the organizational rubric, what kind of organization, organizational format does the idea of Aam Aadmi Party stand for? And second is under the intellectual ideological things of what kind of conversations does it make possible? So my claim is that the phenomena called Aam Aadmi Party of which the reality called Aam Aadmi Party is only a faint approximation. And I would not wish to make too many claims for the reality right now. You know, but because I'm in a university and university is a place where you can talk big, you can talk about something deeper, something, something beyond the obvious, beyond the headlines, beyond the nine o'clock television show. So let me then speak of the two big ideas that drive it. To my mind, the two broad things, two rubrics under which we can talk about the idea of Aam Aadmi Party is one is the organizational innovations. The idea of Aam Aadmi Party stands for things which are new in political organizations, which were not considered possible a few years ago. Realization of which is crucial for a new kind of politics. And secondly, Aam Aadmi Party also stands for some new intellectual conversations. I would argue that many conversations in this country had reached a dead end. And Aam Aadmi Party provides a way of opening those conversations, of taking it forward. Let me deal with the first quickly, and I want to spend some time on the second. In organizational terms, what do we identify Aam Aadmi Party with? We identify Aam Aadmi Party with honest politics, different kind of politicians, politicians who are like, who are like us, who are not very different. Uh, sometimes people like us can become dangerous because that can also mean uh, desire for politicians who can come and give lectures in law school in English, uh, which I think is a very unrealistic expectation in a country like ours. 
uh, you would get a few. But to expect that to be the norm is then to expect people to come from a very tiny class into politics. That's not what the Ahmadmi Party idea should be. Uh, but yes, the idea that you don't have to have a special pedigree, that you don't have to come from, uh, you don't have to represent moneyed interest, that you can be an ordinary person. That is to say, in terms of inherited social privileges, in terms of accumulated wealth, you can be like any other person and yet have an entry into politics. This is unusual. This is not what we thought was possible because quite some years ago we had started believing that politics is only for a few, only those few who are born with a silver spoon or born with, uh, you know, uh, born in just the right kind of family, born with the right surname. That's what politics was confined to. So yes, Aam Admi Party stands for, uh, for a more opening of political class, opening of our political elite to entry from, uh, in, in, a stand, in a sense it stands for widening of the talent pool of politics. Lots of people who never thought of entering politics are today in politics. If you look at Ahmadmi MLAs uh, in Delhi today, you would be amazed, astonished to see characters who you would never associate with politics. Um, our young MLA Sarita, I think of our person Sanjeev Jha, I think of Pankaj Pushkar, I think of many of them. Uh, you wouldn't just expect that people of that kind can be in politics. So yes, one, it stands for expanding, enlarging the pool of the entry pool uh, from which politics draws its resources. Two, related to that, the idea of Ahmadmi Party stands for spirit of volunteerism. You see, we use the word volunteer very often, but we've actually forgotten the root of the word. The word volunteer draws from doing things voluntarily, the spirit of volunteerism, which had almost disappeared from politics. You know, you had people who were professional politicians or you had political workers. So basically politics was being done by two or three kinds of characters. Those who had inherited privileges, those who were professional middlemen. You know, you had made so much money and then you were professional fixer, professional middlemen. Or political workers who are in the patronage network. You know, uh, I belong to someone. Uska admi hai gaon mein. You know, that's how politics is. So it's a large political patronage network. And we had forgotten that politics could be done for something other than that as well. So the idea of AAP then, secondly, stands for spirit of volunteerism, bringing back spirit of volunteerism to politics. And so much of energy, excitement about Ahmadmi Party is actually because of this. Because you normally don't expect people to be driven by ideals. You don't expect people from Tamil Nadu to come and campaign in Delhi where they don't even have a sweater. They don't know how to handle the cold of Delhi. I mean, not only that they don't know the language, they don't even you know, deal with the cold in Delhi. But they are sure, they are sure for 20 days they are working hard for something much bigger, much larger. So that's the second thing. Third, Aam Admi Party stands for connecting the energy of social movements back to mainstream politics. This is a connect which had disappeared, which had broken down. All over the world, movements and political parties have a constant give and take. This is a very standard, healthy interaction. In our country, that had broken down. Uh, it happened with the JP movement. It happened in a tiny way with the Naxalite movement. A tiny way because much of that went outside the political, you know, mainstream politics. Uh, but what this movement did, what the ARP phenomena has done, is to reconnect politics, mainstream politics, to social movements. If you look at Aam Aadmi Party candidates, for example, throughout the country, half of them come from social movements, movements of Jan Jangal Jameen, movements around, you know, uh, of, of uh, displacement, movements for farmers, move, women's movements, all kinds of movement groups where the movements were 
waiting for that energy to be released in mainstream politics. Aam Aadmi Party becomes that channel through which that connect has happened. So that's third. And fourthly, uh, Aam Aadmi Party phenomena stands for the spirit of Swaraj. The idea that politics and that, that political organizations can be run in a truly democratic spirit. I know you may wish to ask me a question or two on that today, but as I said, today I'm not really trying to get into the, the, the reality called Aam Aadmi Party. I'm interested in the idea called AAP, if you make that distinction. Uh, then the spirit of AAP is that after years and years of familiar kinds of political parties, there comes an organization which talks about Swaraj. It's a very unfamiliar, this is a word we had forgotten in the last 60 years. That uh, people could, that, that, that a political organization could be driven by volunteers, not just the spirit of volunteerism that I've already spoken about, but also a certain democratic space within political parties. And if you don't believe me, just go to my party's Facebook, go to my party's website, and just look at what is being talked about for the last seven days. I happen to be one of the parties to the dispute, so I wouldn't take sides right now. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact that in no other political party can you actually have these things written officially by people who officially belong to that party and this free for all conversation which is taking place. It is so rare in Indian political parties to have conversations of this kind. Don't get me wrong, I'm not taking sides in this position right now and this evening it's not my dharma to take sides. I'm just trying to say it is so unusual for any organization to have this kind of free conversation as you are witnessing in the last 10 days or so. So, I've discussed one part of it, which is, as a political organization, what does the idea of AAP stand for? And I've said idea of AAP stands for expansion of the pool of politics, of bringing back spirit of volunteerism, of reconnecting with energy of social movements, and with an inner democratic space, rediscovery of inner democratic spaces. This is what the idea of AAP stands for as an organization. What does the idea of AAP stand for in terms of, in terms of ideology, in terms of big, big issues of our time? You know, they say, what does your party stand for? And uh, a leading intellectual once wrote an article saying this Aam Aadmi Party is a thoughtless party. You know, they have no ideology. Everyone tells us, you people have no ideology. I keep saying, look, categories always lie in the eyes of the beholder. You know, it's like beauty. They say beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. It's not just beauty. All categories lie in the eyes of the beholder. If I say, in this room, I don't see a pattern. It is because my eyes are looking for a pattern which is not there. Maybe I could just say, ah, large number of women in this room, very different. Why would I make this remark? Because if I were to stand in IIT, I wouldn't find so many women sitting among the audience. So my eyes are conditioned to look at something. I find a difference, I notice and I comment about it. So categories, patterns lie in the eyes of the beholder. When someone says, AAP has no ideology, what they mean to say is that I have certain boxes and you don't fit into one of those boxes. You're not Gandhian, you're not socialist, you're not Marxist, you're not liberal. You know, who are you? Clearly, you don't belong anywhere. That precisely is the point. I would make a bold claim. My claim is that Aam Aadmi Party is actually an opportunity space for us to move beyond the ideological boxes of the 20th century and to discover 
new ideological configurations for the 21st century. I'm not saying Aam Aadmi Party is thinking for 21st century. No, I'm saying it's an opportunity space, a space where many conversations which had reached a dead end are now beginning to be opened up. I do not know how long the space would last. I do not know how creatively this space will be used. But I want to mention four respects in which the country's serious ideological conversations in this country had come to a dead end and where the phenomena called AAP, idea called AAP, provides us a new opening. First of all, on questions of economy, there's a lot of confusion about AAP and we love it. You know, people say you're left winger, Someone says, no, but, but you know, you're saying certain things you are, which are right-wing, etc. And we often say, but who said that everything in the world must fit into one of these two boxes, left or right? You know? Yes, we do. You know, last, uh, when we succeeded in Delhi and they asked me in an interview, I said, Aam Aadmi Party represents class politics without class struggle. There is unmistakably an element of class politics in, your, uh, in, in Aam Aadmi Party. I do not know how many of you sitting in this room would be AAP supporters. Maybe many of you would be. But I can take a bet that if we were to do a survey among the manual workers of our, your university, the chokidars, the sweepers and so on, I can take a bet that my party will come out with 80% votes among them. You know. So there is a class dimension to AAP support. Uh, someone you know, uh, CSDS did a very decent survey. It did a very decent post-mortem of Aam Aadmi Party's uh, vote shares. And it basically shows that among the very top layer, Aam Aadmi Party had an advantage over BJP of only 4%. In the second next, in the next layer, Aam Aadmi Party's lead was 16%. In the third quarter, Aam Aadmi Party's lead was 28%. And in the bottom quarter, Aam Aadmi Party's lead was 44%. So it's a straight pyramid. You know. So there is class politics, yes. But this class politics does not come with the familiar ideology of class struggle of the 20th century. It comes with something else. And that is why it, begin, it becomes very difficult for people to understand. Because in the 20th century, we are used to two of, two of these polarities. What the phenomena of AAP does is to open a conversation for politics, for an economy which is pro-people, but which is willing to look at new instruments of what it means to be pro-people. You know, in those labels called socialism, called left, it stands for two different things. Left, being left, being socialist, stood for people who were pro-poor. In that sense, of course, Aam Aadmi Party is, is left, socialist, whatever, but that's written in our constitution, so there's nothing unique here. But the left and socialist also stood for something else. It also stood for certain instruments of how to be pro-poor. Pro it stood for public sector, license, quota, regulations, state intervention, because the belief in the 20th century was that if you want to serve the poor, state is the agency. State has to be at the center. It's only in and through state, through state agencies, through public sector, through license, through quota, through regulations, that you can serve the poor. The idea of AAP begins to uncouple these things and says, yes, in a country like India, in a city like Delhi, working for the poor has to be your central priority. But in order to work for the disadvantaged, you do not need to extract from the advantage, which is to say, rob them. Number two, you don't need to, in other words, you don't need to focus only on distribution. You need to increase size of the pie, which is insufficiently attended to by the 20th century ideologies. And that in order to do so, state need not be the only agency. 
you can just be agnostic. You know, the funny thing is that I find economists to be the most ideological in this world. All other disciplines, you can speak to them, you can argue with them. Economists, a discipline which is based on evidence, which is supposed to be more empirical than any other, than any other thing, they tend to be more religious and dogmatic and ideological than anyone else. But we need to restore the spirit of agnosticism, which is to say, what is the best way of serving the poor? Well, let's check it out. In some cases, private agencies work. Why not let them work? In some cases, subsidies are terrible. Do away with them. In some cases, subsidies work. Let's use them. So why can't we be agnostic in thinking about how best to serve the disadvantaged? This is a conversation about economy, which the phenomena of ARP begins. I do not know how far this conversation will take place, but it's a very important conversation that we need to have in the 21st century, namely how to combine state and market in ways that are intelligent, in ways that work, in ways that deliver something for the poor and the disadvantaged. That's number one conversation. Number two conversation that we need to have is about secularism. In our country, we've had two kinds of frozen positions. On the one hand, we have the dominant model of secularism, which is very Western, very distanced from our culture and traditions, which is very proper, which is very constitutional because our constitution prescribes this to be the case, but which ordinary people cannot connect with. So it's very deracinated, westernized secularism, which only a few anglicized people in this country can practice. I don't know if they practice it at home, but at least in public places, they say they practice it. On the other hand, you have its opposite reaction, majoritarianism which is simple, brute, naked assertion that majority community shall rule the roost and will define the rules of the game. The trouble is that both of these have started mimicking each other. And over the years, secularism, which is one of the most sacred principles of our constitution and which ought to be the case, uh, has come to stand for a certain kind of hostage politics. And by hostage politics, I mean this, that politics of secularism over the years have come to be a, quite a hypocritical politics. It's basically a politics of keeping minorities hostage, keeping them hooked on, keeping them insecure. Basically, the name of the game of so-called secular politics in this country has been keep minorities insecure, tell them, look, there is a you, security is the biggest issue you have and we are there to help you. And just in case you forget it, we'll engineer some situations so that it reminds you that you are insecure. So because you are minority, don't talk about water, don't talk about electricity, don't ask for schools, don't talk about hospitals. Security is your only concern. This is what the politics of secularism has unfortunately been reduced to. In this, the idea of ARP opens up the possibility of a new politics of secularism, which recognizes minorities not only to be minority, but to be just plain ordinary citizen of the country, which have the same rights and duties as normal citizens have. This is a new conversation. It is beginning, but I think there is enormous promise in this because this is the way to go forward. Third conversation is about nationalism itself. Indian nationalism at the time of our freedom struggle was a very open liberal ideology. I can't think of many countries except South Africa. South Africa is the only real exception where nationalism is so open-minded and open-hearted. You know, one thing so remarkable about Indian nationalism is that there is not a trace of racialism in Indian nationalism. There is no anti-white syndrome in our nationalism. You know, it's so rare for colonies to have a freedom struggle 
which does not demonize people of the other race. And there was a clear racial distinction between those who colonized us and between us. And one thing that I take pride as an Indian in our Indian national movement is that not for a minute did you have any racial sentiment in it. So our freedom struggle was very open-ended. Our nationalism was very deep and rich. However, in the last 60 years, that nationalism has been narrowed down. That the symbols of that nationalism have been captured by a very narrow-minded creed. And on the other hand, we have rest of the population, which I described as deracinated, westernized population, which has given up on that nationalism, whose nationalism principally resides in watching cricket matches and once in a while saying India, India, something of that sort. You know. So this is a football club kind of nationalism. It is in this that once again the phenomena of AAP, the idea of AAP, opens up the possibility of a new kind of nationalism. A nationalism that celebrates diversities. A nationalism which is not about nation state, but which is about state nation. That's something I've written about elsewhere, so I wouldn't bore you with all those details. But basically the idea is this, that European model of dealing with diversities was that they basically smothered all the diversities, that they homogenized all the diversities. All the diversities were streamrolled into one pattern. Indian way of dealing with diversity is that we recognize differences, we respect those differences and allow them to coexist. So it's a, it's a blender model or melting pot versus salad bowl. In a salad bowl, each of the pieces is distinct. You can see them. In a melting pot, you all have to melt and become one. Melting pot is the European model. Salad bowl is the Indian model. And there is the possibility of recovering our nationalism in that spirit of diversity. That is the third idea. And fourth and final is opening a conversation about social justice. Social, that may interest students of law because much of the discussion on social justice has split into two directions. On the one hand, you have those who do not think, who do not actually take seriously the idea of social justice, who think that they wish to promote merit. And for them, the way to promote merit is to disregard inherited disadvantages. You know, so the very, there's a lot of thing of, I don't know what is my caste. I am an Indian. I want merit. You know, there's that sort of thing. And the funny thing is that all those who do not know what their caste is, 80% of them come from one caste. You know, because not knowing your caste is a privilege people only of one caste or caste group can have. It's such a caste privilege not to be able to know your caste. So on the one hand, you have that sort of group. On the other hand, you have the other orthodoxy, which is we need social justice. Social justice is equivalent to reservation, reservation based on caste and caste only. So freezing of social, re reduction of social justice to reservations as the only instrument and caste as the only criteria. You know. So you have these two things going again in two opposite directions. And to my mind, the phenomena of AAP, the idea of AAP, is about opening that conversation up once again to recognize the centrality of social justice in our context, to recognize the fact that we are dealing with a society where there are deep inherited inequalities. But that in order to deal with those deep inherited inequalities, reservation need not be the only instrument. And caste need not be the only criteria that you deal with. So you're opening up a much richer template, much richer bouquet of social justice policies and politics and rules and laws. I'm sorry it's turned out to be more of an academic lecture, but as you can see, I must have been so starved of academic occasions <laughs> to be able to talk something serious. Uh, but in conclusion, I just want to say, to remind you of the distinction between the idea of AAP and the reality called Aam Aadmi Party. And as Plato reminded us, that 
the reality is always a very poor approximation of a pure ideal. I'm not a Platonist, but in this instance, it's an it's a idea worth using, which is that the way to judge the reality is to be able to see what is it that it's trying to approximate. That allows us to measure distances. In distance, there always are. There always is a distance between the practice, because the everyday practice, and the ideal that is being pursued. But understanding that spirit enables us to have a yardstick. You know, you begin to say, okay, this is where I would judge it from. This is how I, dis you know, uh, this is the distance that I would measure. This is how I would do that. That's why I thought of concentrating, concentrating on the idea of up. In conclusion, I would wish to say, up may be a very precarious idea. And speaking this afternoon, I would concede that if you were to look at the social media today, or if you would look at the newspapers tomorrow morning, it would indeed look like a very, very precarious and fragile idea. But please remember, it's also a very precious idea. It is in that precarious reality and that precious idea that there is this space, space for creative and alternative politics. Welcome to that idea. Thank you.